I, I was a public school kid. I do wish I got some of that more specific schooling and trades. I was a liberal arts kind of kid, so that's why I found improv Me too. comedy. Yeah, that's, Me too. That's, this is where, yeah. We, we, Jordan, my wife wishes I got some education in the trades, you know? Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can think, but can you pound a nail into this door? The answer is no. Uh, we yeah, were going to, and Jordan and I were going to go into the garage door business, and we had an argument about who would actually do the uh, work. We millions. could both do you the could make millions. Yes, you could make yes, millions. So. That's what you realize. You're like, <laughs> Maybe oh my god. We should Lord. go Every, back to school. You know, like <laughs> Steph went back to Davidson and got his degree. Maybe we should go back. <laughs> Jordan, good to be with you today. This is, these are, as you know, somber times. Uh, it, it's it's really incomprehensible. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been trying almost not to watch news, no, knowing what these stories are, uh, just looking for solutions. And, and yet again, we get bogged down into the same cycle. As as, as you know, I've, we've we've both talked about this issue, covered this issue, approached this issue from many different angles. And I think, like, I did a special about this, and we're still ye- yelling at the same you know, folks who hold the potential for some form of action. You're never going to solve situations like this completely, but gosh darn, it's so infuriating that it feels like we're, we're not even going to try. And I think that's what is such a such a gut punch day in and day out. You know, um, I mean, there's, there's probably three elements to this. First of all, the guns, okay? And there's just too many of them. They've proliferated and it causes a problem. I mean, I don't know how people can't – I think they do see it. Some people don't want to say that that's a problem. To me, it's a problem. I will tell you that in 1994, I voted for the assault weapons ban. And what I got from it was they wanted to – there were some in our, in our party, in our conference, with the conferences you know, in the House, the Republicans, wanted to strip my committee away from me. Uh, and, of course, the NRA was – very angry, and they went out to try to defeat me, and I kept my committee, and I won re-election. And then, um, I only tell you this so that people can understand you can survive. So when I ran for governor- well, I think that's an the, important thing. I, I do think that's an important thing to underline, because- Yeah, I agree. It feels like it, it, it happened before, and it had tangible effects. Uh, these types of shootings went down, and Yeah, the I think- problem was that the, the, the gun manufacturers found loopholes and did it really do that much, but it was a start, Okay. Mm-hmm. And we need to look at all that. Secondly, um, you know, when I did it, the, the, the law enforcement organizations were the ones that really said, we're being outgunned and you need to do this. And so I did it. So when I ran for governor, though, in 2010, the NRA opposed me, sent people out across the state trying to defeat me. I was running against an incumbent who, I don't know where he was, but they endorsed him. And then that police organization <laughs> endorsed him too. <laughs> so so I, I was like, oh, for two. But guess what? I won. I won. So it's not that I'm a, a great guy because I'm not against all these guns. I'm just for reasonable changes in them. So that's, that's, that's the first thing. And can we get there? I don't know. I saw one of the senators being interviewed, and there may be some people who will do some things. The second issue, Jordan, is this issue of mental health. You know, the the money and the networking that needs to be provided for mental health, both for pediatric mental health, young kids, and for adult mental health is critical. There needs to be networks. There needs to be more people who can provide help, uh, more experts in the field. And, you know, there's got to be insurance that they can pay for for getting these behavioral treatment. And um, it's... You know, and they they look at it, they put some money in, but it has to be a systemic change. Mm -hmm. But then I would ask you this, where do these people, where is this hate coming from? You know, what do you think about that? I mean, how do we have such a toxic culture that a guy drives to New York and targets African-Americans right in that grocery store and the hate that we see in Texas? And this is just two of them. There's so many of these. Where where is this coming from in in your in your view? Well, I mean, I th- I think you've hit the nail on the head with a, a handful of those things. Yes, too many guns, and we can debate uh, about what kinds of guns are on the streets. But most Americans, I think, the last numbers around ninety percent, 
increase these background checks. When I go out and I talk to gun owners in America, uh, guess what? They don't want this happening on their watch. They don't want to be uh, seen as crazy folks or like real gun owners in America. They respect their guns. They lock them away. Uh, uh, They don't want tragedy to befall them. That's why people want background checks. Assault weapons, that's that's not as contentious as uh, it's being portrayed in the media. So many people don't want kids to... It's an 18-year-old. He bought these guns legally, and I think that's what's so infuriating. And I think... There are common sense moves that are more popular among the bases than they were talked about in the media. I think, I think you're right. I and think I think you're right. I, I, mental health is another big thing. It always comes up. And I think, like, of course, America has a huge mental health issue uh, uh, right now. We, we, we don't fund it nearly enough. Greg Abbott is talking about how we need to fund uh, mental health initiatives. He cut that months ago when there wasn't a mass shooting that took place. And I think that's what's also infuriating to me is, like, again, these talking points, they're just freaking talking points to get them to the the next thing where they don't have to hold accountability. So well, you that's know, super Jordan, fun. the interesting thing is we've got a great guest today. So tell us about tell us about our guest. I know she's a friend of yours. Tell us she a is. little bit. And I know you're you're delighted to have her. You, there's a, <laughs> this there's a, a twinkle setup. in your eyes. This is, what's you know? so, this is what's so tough. I mean, dear Lord, it's like we're bringing on somebody. She is a friend. She's a writer. She's an actor. She's an activist. Uh, and we're setting her up in, but this is what America is. All of your setups are, you're being born into an apocalyptic scenario. So let's try to find a path through. Uh, she currently writes and stars on the show Rutherford Falls. The second season begins streaming on Peacock June 16th. Jana Schmeeding. Jana, how are you? Hi. I'm horrible. <laughs> you know. <laughs> horrible. horrible. Couldn't be worse. Couldn't be worse. Like, what the hell? Th- very, very, very happy to be here, however, um, and to talk to you both. Um, I was just emailing with Jordan earlier, Governor, and saying I'm so excited to talk to him because, you know, it's just really good to have people like the two of you who are, a, a, you know, a touchstone of sanity in what feels like an uncontrollable situation and, you know, people who are very um, activated by this issue. I just can't not... Um, be affected by what's going yeah. on culturally right now, as I'm sure you are. Well, you know, John, I, I, it's, uh, it's really across the board, though. You know, I mean, it's this issue, but we have a such terrible polarization, and I think Jordan's absolutely right. Most Americans are in the middle. They just got to realize that these siren songs that come from the left and the right, depending which group they're in, just don't take it all. Don't drink all that don't drink all that Kool-Aid, you know, realize you have to think for yourself. And what do you want for your kids? What do you want for your, for the people you love, for your neighbors, right? So it, it's just a number of things that we are grappling with in this country. But I, I'm, I'm convinced that people have good sense and they will wake up. And, and look, you've been through a lot yourself, right? A lot of discrimination or a lot of not understanding you and so many things. So we're delighted to have you. I want to. I want to. I want to get Jana's thoughts on what, what what happened here in Texas. And I think what a lot of people might not know, they might know Jana from Rutherford Falls, the great show on Peacock. I knew Jana before that, back in the comedy community here in New York. But when I'm hanging out with Jana and seeing Jana in New York at doing comedy shows at night, she's going home and going to a New York public school and teaching during the day. And so I think part of your background is in education, you're in these classrooms. And so I'm curious when you see these things taking place in classrooms, like what runs through your head and what what are we putting not only the families and the children through, but the the teachers who are in that classroom? Yeah, it's a very, um, it's a devastating situation, I think, because, you know, I was a a public educator in, um, in the Bronx for 10 years before I moved to Los Angeles to sort of transition careers into a very frivolous (laughs) industry. (laughs) Comedy. Um, But before that, yes, you're right, Jordan, I was sort of splitting my time in New York City between, um, you know, teaching during the day and um, going and doing sort of my own hustle, my own comedy hustle at night. And something I think that we can all agree on as parents and educators and members of communities is that a school – I mean, there's so many things I can say about this. But the the things that I really feel strongly about are that 
public schools and schools school communities are, are are one of the last bastions of public service that we have in our culture these pla- these places hold so much power to heal and to provide safety and what i don't think a lot of people understand is because of some of the um um underfunding that has happened in public schools is that a lot of times um, the students that are attending public schools are, um, you know, experiencing poverty in their own lives, experiencing um, sort of the trickle down effects of policy that is happening in, you know, higher levels than they will ever have access to. So my job teaching in the Bronx in one of the poorest congressional school districts in the country, um, every day I felt like I was you know, problem solving to my mo- to the most intense degree personally, doing, you know, putting out fires and and helping students um, navigate some of the systemic injustices that are happening more systemically. Right. So like it's we see in our students um, the manifestations of policy that that we are enacting or not enacting that's like they catch it all right there they're the most vulnerable population and it's just heartbreaking to see um entire school communities affected in this way because as an educator you know you're working so hard not only to educate students but also to like raise them these i I read a, a um an interview with one of the teachers um from the most recent massacre, and she was saying, you know, she had a very hard time getting through the interview, as I'm sure, of course, everyone is right now. But she was saying, these are not just these parents' kids. Like, these are my kids. These are my kids. And I'm, like, hearing them down the hall, you know, screaming for help. And, and like, to me, that is, like, uh, I can't – I just can't wrap my head around – what it must be like to be an educator right now, the pressure that you experience, the danger that you experience. I've also heard things about um, people saying teachers should strike. You know, teachers unions tend to have a lot of power uh, statewide, but it it just like boggles the mind that um, we expect so much from our teachers already. We expect so much from them and we give so little to our educators, we we devalue education so much culturally right now, um, and uh, you know having to work through COVID, having to figure out that whole situation, and then this coming on the heels is just it's 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 hard to be an educator right now. And the people that are still doing it, I am not, but the people who still are are the most dedicated people in the world. They're 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 they love their job and they love their students. You know, they're not (laughs) they could leave if they wanted to, but they don't want to despite everything. And to me, that is just it is just so appalling that we would do that to school, entire school communities. It's just it it boggles the mind. And I, I don't know how I don't know what to do other than just wield the power that educators have, you know, even though it doesn't feel like educators have power, like we do, but it has to be so grand, it seems. It has to be such big, a big move after all the things that we've tried to do to prevent gun violence in our country. It just seems so vast that we we have to have these grand gestures and these general strikes and whatnot. It's just like, what is going to work? What is going to work at this point? Jana, let me let me just say to you that in our state, there were always two big issues that we had to deal with. One was Medicaid, which affects the poor, but the other one was education. And those were the two top items. And so in our in our state, and I think it's true pretty much across the country, number one is the issue of uh, of this funding and how do you balance a budget and how do you do all that? And I think as you look across, People do recognize that education is important. That's why it's either the first or the second largest amount of funding uh, in 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 the budget. And um, but I also think we need to try different things in education. You know, we have a KIPP school out here, which uh, 
this wonderful lady uh, created. Uh, it's not it's not restricted. It's, frankly, frankly, they just want people who don't have much income to go to that KIPP school, and they're turning out kids that are incredible. I mean, they have a number of them. They're going to Harvard. They're going to Princeton. I mean, it's amazing. And I think that we should all embrace a new way of thinking about education. It doesn't have to be the way it was, you know, a hundred years ago because things have changed. But uh, there, there are resources, and it's also helped, of course, by the federal government in a variety of ways. But what you're expressing is the frustration that, you know, going through COVID, particularly teachers had, I mean, it was just unbelievable, right? Uh, And how did you bring students along, particularly if they didn't have uh, the ability to really navigate? Um, But we got through that. And some students have been left behind, which takes us back to the mental health issue. But, um, But there is a recognition that teachers are are critical people in public service whether they're police or whether they're fire or teachers that uh, they are remarkable people and I'll bet you had many victories didn't you over in the Bronx tell us about a couple of the victories you had with some of these uh, young people that you were able to get them on the right path. Maybe you've got a story or two. Well, I will say that most of our students were already on the right path. Like there's sort of this inherent belief that poor students or students in, um, you know, underserved neighborhoods or under-resourced, you know, communities are destined to like fuck up, pardon my French, but they're not. They're, they're, seeking, you know, a, a good life for themselves. And exactly. so really it's just a matter exactly. of of a school um, having that um, student first attitude built into the community and prioritizing school, uh, prioritizing student needs um, when it comes to scheduling and when it comes to, um, you know, even like the class organization, what classes each student is going to. I taught special education students. So I worked with students with um, uh, learning disabilities and um, um, social emotional disabilities. And well, that's a gift that you could do that. That's, that's a, that's a great gift. And I will tell you one thing. And I know in our state, you know, the, the richer districts always wanted to have their share. And I always said, wait a minute, you can support taxes in your own school district. Don't take money away from the poor districts where they don't have the ability to do it. And we did a little shifting, but I did not win the kind of victories that I wanted to there because we want to make sure that there are adequate dollars behind every pupil in every school because every kid deserves a right to, to realize their dreams. Which and, and what you were doing with special ed, I mean, that's that's a gift. Thanks yeah, for doing I, it. I, it was my pleasure. I, I think, you know, part of the um – the way I was, I was raised by educators. Um, my, both of my parents are educators and my, uh, maternal grandparents are educators. My grandmother got her PhD, uh, in, um, early. So you didn't get away with anything when you were in school. Teachers (laughs) ratted on you to your parents. Like I never went to a school where there wasn't a parent in my school. Um, (laughs) I'm a real good girl, governor. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I know who's butt to kiss in this society and it's teachers. And yeah, I I agree with you that there are a lot of really great solutions that are happening in terms of like different kinds of educational, you know, experiences for students to have. I worked at a a CTE school, which was a career technical education high school before I um, stopped being a teacher. And we were um, required that our students particularly in this at this school, our students um, uh, learned um, construction trades along with getting their um, core requ- uh, credit requirements to graduate. They also had to uh, study a one of the five um, construction trades um, in the discipline. So, you know, HVAC, uh, here, plumbing, here. carpentry, yep. um, uh, architecture, you know, so they had sort of these tracks and and um and to for me the 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 victories that i got to see um were that you know understanding that uh university or college education wasn't always like the the best course of action for different students and a lot of times our students were ready to jump into unionized labor the labor force after high school and were like right. making more money than i was as a 10 year 
teacher. Like this is uh, this is sort of the the if we open our mind to what education really can be, um, there are so many different ways to approach it, and and so many valuable experiences that students may or may not have access to um, when we are um, adhering so firmly to. I suppose, um, I, I guess I don't want to get too far into like the critical race theory of it all, but like when we're, when we are politicizing education so much, we sort of forget about some of the core values of, of public education and, and providing really incredible opportunities for our students. I mean, I think you've, what kind of breaks my heart and is also inspiring, but, but when you were discussing earlier, like that, <laughs> These classrooms catch all of the successes and the failures of a society. And so they are vulnerable in that our inability to either fund or the fighting that we're having on a national level over race. Um, who sees that is the student who now can't read these books or now who talking to their teacher who's supposed to provide them guidance. Well, their teacher is this politicized person within there. And you start to see that with like the mask mandates. It's difficult enough for teachers to have to communicate. And now, whether or not they're wearing masks or what have you, it's being put on them to make political decisions in a room, therefore defying the trust of kids who are hearing stuff at home and or on Zoom. And then suddenly, not only are they, you know, pawns in this political game, now we have these these terrible shootings uh, where we have a society that doesn't know how to handle this, and these vulnerable people are yet again the recipients of um, our... Yeah. Our, our failings. And I think it's it's heartbreaking. It's also inspiring to hear you talk about that as a public service, a public good that I do think, again, needs to continue to be yelled from the, the rafters. I, I was a public school kid. I do wish I got some of that more specific schooling and trades. I was a liberal arts kind of Me kid. Too. So that's why I found improv comedy. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, this is where, yeah. We, we, Jordan, my wife wishes <laughs> I got some education in the trades, you know. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can think, but can you pound a nail into this door? The answer is no. Uh, no we yeah, were going to gr- and Jordan and I were going to go into the garage door business, and we had an argument uh, about who would millions. actually do the you work. Millions, you could make millions. We could both do the advertising. Yes, you could make yes, millions. So That's what you realize. You're like, maybe oh my we Lord, should go back age. to school. You know, like Steph went back to Davidson and got his degree. Maybe <laughs> we should go back. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. John, I just want to ask you about this. You grew up in a in a different culture. You're Native American. What was it like uh, trying to educate your classmates, your friends, being in the town? I mean, there must have been some some really cool experiences along with the, yeah, the challenges, it was, huh? Um, I was raised by um, by a family who um, really believed in and exuded and and you know held dear um, to our identity and and making sure that the people that we are communing with are also educated about our identity um, <laughs> for better or <laughs> that sounds exhausting. That sounds like you're, you're like, oh, my parents are educators. Also, when we go into school, we have to educate other people about our own identity so they understand. That sounds it that is, sounds it awful. It is <laughs> exhausting. I I feel like I've never not been a teacher in my life. I I still am like, you know, I, the amount of illiteracy that, um, America and American people have around indigenous issues and indigenous people, and especially contemporary indigenous people is a huge failing of our culture. I believe, um, you know, earlier governor, you were saying like, what breeds this kind of hatred? Well, ignorance breeds it. And, and our, and our, you know, our founding fathers were slaveholders. So we, we have to sort of follow this sort of understanding in, in my opinion that, um, you know, we have to see the inherent value in diversity as a, as a culture. And we are just aren't there. We haven't been there. Um, Native people have been fighting for visibility for, Forever, You know, one of the biggest issues that we face and the reason that I was like such a young little teacher having to do stupid cultural presentations to my classmates every Thanksgiving (laughs) is because we face erasure in politics. We face erasure in education. 
um, and we face erasure in media. So those three big, you know, um, sort of cultural pillars, we are not represented. And um, and it's not for a lack of trying. Um, it's a very hard, like, systemic injustice that we face. And so um, n- with that being an awareness that my grandparents and parents had, you know, I grew up, I was raised in a small, pretty conservative white town um, that was predominantly white. And um, there were a couple of native people. There were a lot of, um, you know, indigenous and central South American migrant workers in our community as well um, and families. And there was some really you know, horrible racist shit that was happening <laughs> around there. And so, yeah, it was, um, I would say that um, I didn't experience a lot of direct oppression, um, you know, in my upbringing. Uh, you know, I don't think, I think that like I am afforded sort of a white coated experience <clears throat> in my indigeneity. Um, and so I used it. We just leveraged that, you know, we we uh, used our privilege to, you know, do the work of educating those around us. And I will say it was effective. There are a lot of people uh, from my town who uh, seeing Rutherford Falls or knowing that this work is still continuing and and have been like, oh, my gosh, I remember when Jana did the, um, you know, their family held this like Native American awareness day at school where all the classes like engaged in these like workshops and what ha- I mean we just we really went big and we we did what we had to do to sort of I guess thrive in the environment where we were raised and and we were where we were existing and so for better or worse for me I I feel like it was an an effective mission and um and I'm proud of that. Um, and also it was exhausting. And I'm I'm also tired. At the age I am now, I'm tired that I'm tired of, you know, the continued education that needs to be done. <laughs> well, tell me more about that. Could you teach me about what more needs to be done? I wanna I wanna be a good ally. If you could do a good hour and a half of sure, telling me what sure. I need to do. Who I need? <laughs> Let's uh, keep this Zoom on for four more days, just four days straight. <laughs> Great, just w- just give me download it. No, it's it's funny. It, I I am embarrassed by it. you. You say the term erasure, and and I get that you're talking about both in history books and uh, culturally, and I think that's what's so fascinating and important about Rutherford Falls, um, a reservation dogs. Like we're starting to see a little bit of a dare I say boon. Uh, in representation, uh, I, I've and I've talked about this before, but I think I grew up in a, a very supportive, uh, I would say, somewhat progressive or mo- moderate community. Um, m- my understanding of uh, indigenous history or people lied with like a brief comment in a history book, and then also I've I wasn't in Boy Scouts, I was in Indian Guides, which was a thing that happened back well, then. Well, unfortunately, that, you're canceled it was a, now, Jordan. <laughs> I can't, damn it, damn it. I'm, I'm trying, to, I'm addressing it. I'm addressing my blind spots. It was, but like, that is something that I've looked at. Yeah. This is a bunch of well-meaning parents. It's a father and son situation. We went out into the woods. We had powwows. We got into circles. We made campfires. We picked uh, indigenous names. And then we, we danced your, around. What was, I was your, it wasn't an, called an indigenous name, Jordan. <laughs> what was, was it called? <laughs> right. I'm sure it was called an Indian name. Uh-huh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, and and my name was Jack Rabbit. Uh <laughs> My dad was swift foot because he was fast. Uh, yeah. And we did such traditional things like um, sing parody songs to I Heard It Through the Grapevine at uh, Ooh, uh-huh. Sleepover. So uh, it was a very traditional uh, very much, yes. introduction into <laughs> the world of indigenous cultures. Uh, but yeah. I look back at that and I, I do cringe. But I also, I, I, I don't, there, there was no, there, there was nothing malicious about no. it. There was, uh, it was, it was a, a, a truly important moment for me and to my, my father. And I, we had such wonderful bonding experiences about what that was but i just see this ignorance of like oh this was uh this was a part of a culture in a place in america where we had no interaction with 
modern representations of Native American culture. And and we're pulling from, like, you know, things that we had heard about, things that we saw in movies. Yes. And, and essentially you're, you're playing pulling, pretend. Yes, you're pulling from what you have been given, which mm-hmm. has been misrepresentations in popular media. And I, I say, you know, so many people have these experiences, by the way. This is, like, this is, you're not, like at all a minority in expressing this. Almost every white um, friend that I have or non-Native friend that I have has been exposed to this kind, as a young person, Mm -hmm. has been exposed to this kind of learning where it's like, we're doing an Indian thing. That means you get to pretend to be an Indian. And it's very interesting because there's no other real culture, a non-white culture that we do this to in our education, in, in our educational experiences. And I argue that if it were a foundational part of our educational experiences as young people to engage with indigenous content, to engage with indigenous knowledge, how much more aware we would be about um, creating sustainable, you know, energy resources and and creating balance with the natural world and experiencing our our world in a more... um, compassionate and and balanced way but we're getting such a a whitewashed version of it that is just it's appropriative and it's ineffective it doesn't really i might argue that part of the reason we don't engage with it is and i hate to say it but as i think it's seen as a dead culture in some ways it's not as it's 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 more uncomfortable to uh to put on the the culture of something that you see as alive and thriving in other parts yeah. of the world. And I think like probably as a child, it was like, I'm going to put on a feather and dance around here, not because this is offensive or I'm attempting to be a part of a culture that's happening, but because I'm essentially like a historical reenactor. I, yes. I approach it like I would a civil war uh, a reenactment yes. uh, because to me, it's not a modern movement or that has uh, you know modern characters that I could interact with and yes. offend to their face. And as Americans, you know, the the white colonial American paradigm is we uh, we we love to honor that dead culture that we killed. Let's romanticize it and, you know, sort of make it this beautiful, like uh, peaceful thing um, and which contributes to. Ultimately, the erasure of. Well, I, I'm going to, as I always do, I'm going to take an issue with this because I think that Americans are aware that there was in, there was a lot of injustice done, and that I think people are hungry to learn more. I think they're very interested. Yeah. I mean, look at your show. I mean, you know, a lot of shows have one season and they're gone. You're being renewed because people they're learning that that our natives are very, very interested in water protection and proper use of land. And, and the other thing that they would be very interested to, to know about uh, is the great honor of people who are older, uh, you know, that in a, a culture where sometimes we, we don't honor as much as we should our older Americans. Absolutely. But uh, I think people would love, I think they'd be fascinated with more education uh, about what happened in the history and where are we today and what can we do? At you're least so I am, because right. I, mean, I think people I, I guess, are fascinated. You're people so are right. fascinated by this culture. They're fascinated, and for us, for me, living in Ohio, you know, we have an amazing history here. Absolutely, uh, of of the first settlements that were that were created. About how we had tough times, but how we came through it. So. What what I would say is I'm optimistic about the future. I think kids would gobble this stuff up, and your show helps. But we need more. We need a we need some great great stories uh, on you know on Netflix on our streaming channels about the whole the whole the whole history. You're absolutely right in the the fact that. Um I will say that there has been a, a generations of misinformation about indigenous people because we have been portrayed by white people. Um, but largely the, the, the informants like Jordan's experience, you know, it's like a, a troop led by a white person who's doing these things, you know. But and now- I was not in Jordan's troop. I refused to join <laughs> okay, that you're kind of fine, activity. But Jordan is what? canceled. No, he's. I, I mean, all this time, he's are you telling me this didn't exist in Ohio? Come on, Casey. Oh. It's unbelievable, Jordan. <laughs> 
<laughs> what you did my god um but you know it's i think it's um what is happening and i'll i'll say specifically on the show rutherford falls and this is true for reservation dogs as well which is the other comedy um native centric comedy on um fx on hulu <clears throat> um is that people um are showrunners the executives who are creating these shows are native and so the sort of what I will call the storytelling sovereignty is being um, exercised. Native people, we have been grinding and grinding and grinding to get past some of these systemic barriers in our own storytelling um, to like overcome the erasure. And even these little small, you know, my background in educating my small town, like that has served me greatly in in advocating for you know, appropriate information and making sure that, you know, part of my work as a Native woman at my age in my generation is to sort of reclaim the ownership of our stories. And um, now that we have Sierra Teller Ornelas, our showrunner, who's Navajo and Mexican American, and Sterling Harjo, who's Muscogee Creek and Seminole, running those two shows. They are make they are calling the shots. Mm. They are the ones hiring their their native, you know, cast and crew. They are the ones who are running the writer's room. So they are the ones who are developing the narrative. And that's why people are attracted to it, is because it's it is it's I, real. I, it's real. It's real. And it's, it's real. deep. Yes. And I, I take it that, that Jordan is not going to be able to make a guest appearance on your show after <laughs> let me do a, Let me do a traditional karaoke night on one of the episodes. Jordan and I come on. Come oh on. We'll God. come on and, you know, I would, we would I be would great. actually love. I would love. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jana, actually, I mean, a fascinating part about all of this, I think you're you're saying this, it's beautifully, and I think it's it shouldn't be... It should be underscored. It, it's so hard to get to those showrunner positions, and and it's such a it's such a ceiling that's it's it's almost impossible to break through. And yeah. I do think, am I right that is what does that mean, falls? Jordan? What is a show? I don't know what a showrunner. Yeah. Pos- what does that mean, Jenna? What, 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 what's a tr- what's a traditional showrunner like on Rutherford Falls? A show. Uh, uh, well, our showrunner, and I think the sort of traditional showrunner is sort of a newer sort of uh, catch-all term that describes somebody who's an executive producer and who also is. Um, uh, managing the show from the first day of the writer's room to the last edit of uh, all the cuts, you know, the final cut. So they are seeing the entire narrative arc. They have, um, you know, communication. They are managing basically the entire writing staff, cast and crew. They're and, like creatively running the ship, yes, essentially, yes. right? Which And that's where there, and there has been, I think there has been a, a push for, for representation and there's been more diversity in writers rooms i mean even just five years ago writers rooms are so comically white and male and that has been changing but i think the gatekeeper is oftentimes the showrunner and to have that changed and i know i think the writers room is like 50 percent uh indigenous is that Mm -hmm. is that is that correct and and i think a fascinating story with you you started in the writers room not as cast on the show but cast as a writer in the room correct Yeah, it was my first uh, staff writing job, and I didn't know that – I had no intention of being cast on the show, even though, you know, performing was my first love. Um, I was just excited to be writing on this, you know, first Native sitcom ever. Like, that was just a true honor and a a blessing. Um, And then, yeah, they – Sierra wanted to see me. I think she had seen me do stand up uh, at one point, and so she wanted to see me read for the role of Regan, who plays opposite Ed Helms. That doesn't happen. I mean, you're, you're casual about that. I feel like that that is an oddity. You have to be the fu- you have to be the funniest person in the room. Where they're like, "Can you be the lead of this show?" I think. <laughs> Well, so I think there's that. That's in every writer's room. There are writers who are auditioning internally <laughs> to be a performers on that show, and it rarely goes well. So for it to actually be <laughs> agreed upon by being like, "Yeah, Jana should be this lead character that we've been writing for ten weeks. She would be great with Ed Helms. I think that's perfect. That's 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 a that's a difficult step to climb. I'm sure that they were taking a huge risk by even you know auditioning. It was a, what, what a terror! What a giant risk to give you a break, Jana. That's but a that's an insane risk. Who would do that? I'll tell you what. This uh, this is the 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 
sort of things that are behind the scenes in all of this are the, are so um when i talk about like you know sort of this these systemic barriers these like very real hurdles so before i was staffed i was writing pilots that centered a native uh, woman as a lead character. And I was trying to get into all these diversity programs and I was trying to get people to read my scripts so I could get staffed and the industry wasn't having it. I wasn't getting into any of these programs. So there was already this um, understanding industry wide that, um, and this is just back in 2018 and 19, you know, there was this, this is, pre-Rutherford Falls, pre-Reservation Dogs, the industry wasn't finding still marketability in a native central story and native characters telling their own stories. We'll be right back. And now back to the show. Um, Jana, let me ask you, let me (laughs) ask you this question. And that is, because Jordan always says, I was telling him about Portugal. He says, give me your elevator speech. And then, you know, he said, too long. Okay, which he's I right. did listen to that a couple but, days but ago. But I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you about kind of your elevator speech. So people who are listening mm-hmm. have had, for, for most of them, have had no real contact with a Native person. They just, they just have it. So what are the three or four or five things that you would say that makes the Native person people special what are the, what is it that oh no this setup is impossible no, Governor give Kasich, us. this is not the elevator pitch setup she can, you want she, you want her to elevator pitch i want her no, people I want, to us no i That's, want her to tell no, us no this is i see what you're doing it comes from a good place no this no is, i want her to i want her to say to the folks that are listening who don't know Know this, know that, know the other thing. Yes. Know this. I, okay. Look for this. I, I can I I I know I This I, is tough. This listen, is tough, Jenna. I got this. Babe, you got I've been it? doing this my whole life. She's this got it. I know she's got the brains. Life. Why are you selling her short? Come on. <laughs> Go ahead, Jenna. Um, I, I will say I'll I'll change my elevator speech to instead of, you know, uh promoting all indigeneity as a whole. Right. So here's the elevator pitch of things that people uh People can engage with um, indigenous history and indigenous culture. Right. Um, do some basic research about the indigenous history of your locality. So in your region, in your you neighborhood, in your community, recognize that there are indigenous people living and working alongside you, that there are people who are still active, actively engaging in um, their culture, and it's not – like it's not what you expect um it looks like however there is a respectful um way to approach uh accessing this history and the first thing you can do is start reading and researching indigenous history by indigenous people and by the indigenous people of your land so i always say you can go to native dash land uh dot ca nativeland.ca um and you can find what uh find out on your map using your zip code what native nations um currently reside or traditionally reside used to reside on your right. lands um and then i would say consume indigenous uh media and that's a very basic uh very basic ask it's enjoyable it's educational it's um it is a lens through which you may have not seen the world. Absolutely. Um, and my third thing is, um, this is a more advanced um, sort of teaching, but um, try to understand and respect that Native nations, Indigenous nations are sovereign nations with their own language, government, um, you know, g- cultural traits that are – that are federally recognized. These are treaties that were created a long time ago that told the government how they can engage with native nations. So we have almost international uh, relations with the native nations that we sit right next to, you know, on Rutherford Falls. Um, The town of Rutherford Falls borders the fictional Minnesota nation, but this is a very real representation of what it's like to be a native person in in the States right now, because we exist on and off our our reservations on on our on and off our traditional homelands but we often uh you know our traditional territory butts up against these sort of um largely white 
and, um, you know, small towns, small neighborhoods. And right. so it is, it's a disservice to not know who your neighbors are. Um, also, you know, uh, as even westward expansion and, and early colonial America, there was trade happening. There was, you know, you know, yep. between between communities, between, you know, colonists and native people. It wasn't always violent. <laughs> well, first of all, that was a amazingly long elevator pitch, so, to be I, clear. My I mean, it was God. good. We love a it long on here, right? <laughs> it was good. You know, you, you did mention something that... Um, I, I got to, for my last show, talk with this uh, Native American artist, uh, Chinu Pahanska, who I love. Uh, amazing. Check out his art. He's so fascinating. And he <laughs> continues to this day, put me in my place about so much stuff. But I think that he, like, that. it's almost comical to go to a person, or to anybody, and be like, talk to us about the, the Native experience in America. And I think one of the first things he said was, well, that's an impossibility, uh, not only speaking for... Uh, you're speaking for 540 sovereign nations, yeah. like, and, and I think like, and th there's part there's part of the difficulty in that, right? Like, there are yeah. so many shared experiences, I'm sure, within that native experience, but there's so many independent ones as well that it's it's almost unfathomable for a lot of people to to grasp what that even looks like, especially without kind of representation in modern media. I guess a question for you too, with like Rutherford Falls, like I think there is this important, Americans need to just also engage with modern representations of, of anybody. They, they don't have uh, an image of, and I think yep. that's what's so impressive about Rutherford Falls. What do you think the role of like a sitcom is as far as letting people into those stories? Instead of watching a, a modern documentary on something or you could go to a, a museum and you can see Chinupa's art and you can engage that way the sitcom is a very specific art form uh how have you found that as as a way to introduce people to it also as i'm saying this it feels like already a big burden as opposed to just enjoying a sitcom for a sitcom there's also this secondary burden i yeah. guess i'm asking you to one explain <laughs> how that works and two is that an unnecessary burden that you guys have to deal with in your your writing well i don't we, we don't have to deal with the burden because we just write from our experience as mm -hmm. you know native people and um and you know something that has happened because of erasure especially in popular media is that um i think that larger audiences don't understand how funny and, you know, multifaceted Native people are, you know, we have amazing senses of humor and we also have a very unique perspective on whiteness and on this kind of colonial experiment that is America. And, uh, you know, we have we have uh, an underutilized uh, point of view. So it's always exciting for people to start to engage engage and and you know find humor with us and especially on rutherford falls we're speaking to a more pan-indigenous experience right we're not like we are using a fictional tribe we are taking place in the northeast uh the location of the show it takes place in the northeast because that's where early colonialism happened and you know we love to clown on like colonial williamsburg and sort of these like romanticized old colonial uh ways of being like you know things that americans sort of tend to love um but i think comedy comedy has always been my method of you know in telling stories and there are a handful of us native people who choose comedy as our storytelling you know vehicle and we just have not never gotten the chance so i would say one of the biggest like i guess um ways that the the the, the biggest like oh the overwhelming experience has been showing native people has been playing to a native audience essentially Showing Native people that we are here and that we are ready to laugh and that we are ready to experience joy and that we – seeing ourselves reflected at all is huge, okay? And, and, and also for a larger audience to um, use comedy to sort of expose some of these injustices that we're dealing with 
is an easier, more palatable way to enter into those kind of spaces. And we've gotten great responses from people on both sides of the political spectrum, you know? So it, 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 uh, uh, Rutherford Falls, I think, especially sort of like, it's not really, um, performing to any one audience. It's sort of just exposing what it's like to be in a friendship as a native person with a non-native person. And and these are how you're navigating, you know, some of these harder um, conversations, especially right now about history and injustice and justice and, um, you know, history. <laughs> I mean, there, there's also something that, not to like... It, it, you know, we're talking about the things, the machinations behind how these things get made and the importance of representation. But what, what shouldn't be forgotten is how funny this show is, how it's a comedy, how accessible it is. And there's also something, too, Mike Schur has been a part of this show, mm -hmm. correct? And and it, it feels within the – it's it's both radical in some of the things that it's covering, but also – dare I say, like comforting in the very specific style of a Mike Schur comedy yes. that is a very modern sensibility that I think in and of itself feels like we don't have we don't have to experience these characters who may be having who may be new to an audience in in a way that feels completely outside the norm. You're actually experiencing them in the way in, in, the, in the modern comedy vernacular in a way that feels very accessible and um and fun and playful in a way that I think is, is yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. I think if people enjoy The Office, if people enjoy um, Parks and Rec, The Good Place, like any of these Mark, Mike Shore joints that are sort of like workplace comedies, but also s talk about, you know, small communities and how governments work. And, you know, uh, The Good Place was a very funny show, but it's about it's about philosophy, you know, and um, Mike likes to um, sort of – uh, zoom in and give you a microcosm of this kind of greater issue. And Sierra Teller Ornelas, our showrunner, who is also a co-EP with Mike Shore and Ed Helms on the show, uh, the three of them sort of, um, they went into this project saying, we want to discuss American history and this thing called the backfire effect, which is we see happening a lot right now, which is sort of this, um, this, um, m uh, psychological phenomenon that that happens when somebody has a deeply held belief and they are challenged on that belief and the way in which uh people dig their heels into that uh despite new truths um being presented right yeah, like so how Sacagawea might not have been as happy <laughs> as we thought there's sometimes confronting hey, with that can listen, be scary with your history jordan i think you should you should be a little careful here. <laughs> I enjoy. Oh, I enjoy look this. Our, you're, look you're at our terrific, Cub Jonah. Scout speaking out against. The yeah. <laughs> I've repented. I've repented for my times. Our white savior has come again. Yeah. Uh, Jana, this has been fantastic. Watch Jana on Rutherford Falls. The all new second season begins streaming June sixteenth on Peacock. Jana, thanks for chatting with us. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to the, the extended four-hour version where you can educate us a little bit more so oh. we can do this right. And so do I. <laughs> Thank you, Jana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Jordan here, uh, your favorite host of the Kasich Klepper podcast. Thank you for listening this far. If you like what you hear, click like or thumbs up or whatever icon signifies a positive reaction. We love your ratings. We love your thoughts. Reach out to us on social media. Let us know what you want us to talk about because I'm tired of answering the governor's questions and I just prefer to answer yours. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon. Kasich and Klepper is a production of Treefort Media, hosted and executive produced by John Kasich and Jordan Klepper. Treefort Media's executive producers are Kelly Garner, Lisa Ammerman, and Matthew Kugler. Line producer is Oscar Guido. Audio direction by Tom Monahan, head of audio for Treefort. With production and editing by Maxwell Carney. Talent booking by Blythe Asher. With additional production help from Tim Schauer, Haley Mandelberg, Colin Motel, and Anastasia Ibrahim. This podcast is powered by Acast.